Good evening and welcome to Café Steel Point. My name is Raymond Engel, mm -hmm. I am welcome the host to for tonight and I am also the principal of the Vienna School of Osteopathy. A few months ago when the lockdown started we had a program four or five evenings a, a week. Now the school has taken uh, back on its courses. We are busy teaching and organizing everything, so now we only broadcast every now and then. Uh, but tonight is one of these nights and I'm glad to have you all here. Before we uh, uh, talk about our to a guest of tonight, before I, I'd like to introduce you to him, I want to encourage you to ask questions during the program. If you, type the, if you type your questions in the chat window, uh, our friend will, uh, at, at the, at the, uh, in, in the studio will help us to bring it on screen like he just did right now. And uh, Francesco will see it and uh, we will try to answer them as soon as possible. During the uh, programs of Café Steel Point, I always try to introduce, to invite people that I also had a personal interest in, uh, in, and that I also wanted to talk to personally. And I'm really excited to uh, introduce tonight's guest, which, uh, and this is Francesco Ceritelli. He is a young researcher who is uh, currently reshaping osteopathy with uh, taking osteopathic research into a new direction. He is a, an osteopath, and tra uh, trained as a DO, but he also made a, a PhD in neuroscience and he still got a collaboration with his university, with the University of Pescara, where he is conducting really interesting uh, pro uh, projects that he will tell us uh, about. Also, he created in 2008 a European Research Institute First it was uh, named EBOM, and now it's called CAM Collaboration. And through this institute, he is uniting uh, people from all over Europe who are interested in research. And together, they are really, uh, really productive in publishing uh, articles in journals. When I last looked on, on PubMed, the, the article count for Francesco was 34 articles. So this is, this is really triggering some publication envy in me as someone who would always like to do more research but doesn't find the time or doesn't have the abilities in, 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 a, in a similar way. So it's great to have you here. Uh, let's switch over to Francesco. Buonasera. And thank you for Buonasera. accepting the invitation. Thank you, Raymond, for uh, inviting me. I'm very glad to be part of the Café Steel Point. Um, it's a great pleasure for me, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, some insight that we have through uh, the research. And uh, thank you also for um, the, uh, I'm sure, the yeah, profitable and positively critically uh, thinking discussion that we are going to have. Looking forward to it. But before we get to the topic of tonight, what's the secret of your productivity? You're publishing an incredible amount of articles. How, how do you do that? When do you find the time to write those? Um, I should be honest, is a team collaboration. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not the only, uh, probably I'm the craziest guy uh, in, the, in the team, uh, but definitely uh, what we um, did in the last, in particular in the last five years, is create a, a team of also young uh, osteopaths, but not only, that mm -hmm. are interesting, they are sharing the same vision that we have, sharing the same values, and looking forward to um, uh, address and tackle some problems that might be relevant for the future of osteopathy in order to make it more reliable, mm -hmm. uh, more, let's say, clinically um, effective, and in particular, interdisciplinary. So that's why, actually, as you said, we created uh, in the nonprofit uh, foundation uh, uh, five, six years ago, five years ago, 
uh, that now is collecting and embracing different type of professionals, not only uh, osteopaths, obviously, but different professionals, different collaboration with different university, hospitals, uh, clinicians, uh, also mathematicians, mm -hmm. uh, philosopher, and the uh, different, the uh, li literally different professions. So, um, in this way, we can create a very profitable and critical environment where uh, ideas can be discussed at different level, and the uh, and thus we can optimize time and resources in order to achieve uh, outcomes. So I should say that I'm lucky that I'm working with a group of people mm -hmm. that actually are sharing the same value. And this is always open. So everyone can have an idea, like clinicians, we are all clinicians. And the, the, ideally, all the big question comes from um, clinicians. Because actually we have the, the immediate effect, we can see the immediate, immediate effect after applying uh, techniques, approaches, or uh, anything else within the clinic. So the tight collaboration with clinicians uh, that actually are just sharing the way in which we can do mm -hmm. research is not necessary. Actually, they, they, they run statistical program and they do uh, maths or statistics. But actually, the, uh, the research is part of a very nice and clear project, um, process that embraces different professionals mm -hmm. at different level uh, with different roles, but at the end, the, uh, the outcome is um, valuable for all the different steps. Mm -hmm. that, that would have been my, the next question on my, on my list. How, how did you manage to build that team? How did you manage to motivate osteopath to do research? We find this is very hard. We find osteopaths are interested in helping their patients directly with their hands. They're interested in learning new techniques, learning new practical approaches. But only very few we find are really motivated for research and they usually stop doing it as soon as they finish their master's degree at our school. So that's, that's a great question, mm -hmm. uh, Raymond. And um, inside the, uh, the foundation, we have what we call the excel excellence pathway that is based on uh, research and then project management, uh, team working and leadership. So what actually we do is build competencies that actually are not just useful for projects or research projects, ah, okay. but actually are, are elements that, that then you can also use in your daily life. Mm -hmm. So if you have an idea on how to manage a project, that could be a research project, yep. but at the same time can be also a clinical project. So how you want to manage, manage better your clinic mm -hmm. in order to measure something and then apply and uh, analyze the data and see how your, your clinics is working. So it creates a way of a different thinking in regards mm -hmm. to research. Because when actually we are in, the, in a clinic, actually we, ha we are at the same time clinician and researcher. Mm -hmm. Why that? Because we, we ask the patient how it feels or he or she feels. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, we took notes. So, and then we compare th those data with the data of the previous session mm -hmm. and how, when actually we compare this data, we are just doing research. Mm -hmm. So it's a research with a different lens. So it's in the way that actually we look at research that is useful in order to understand mm -hmm. that it's research, it's a way of thinking. It's not just a way of doing maths, write the paper and publish. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of looking at the, at the clinical side in a way that can be improved, not only using new techniques, but also understanding how the interaction between uh, the patient and, and, the, and the operator might work better in order to make everything more successful, uh, more patient-centered. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. I think you prepared some slides for, for tonight. Should we have a look at those and sure. go, go so, to the start of your, pro, uh, of your presentation? So the, um, I was very excited by, by your proposal, um, Raymond, regarding what is uh, the, our, um, one of my uh, field of interest, almost recent, recent field of interest, let's say. 
Um, because actually, uh, as you mentioned uh, in your very kind presentation, I did also a PhD in neuroscience that actually came after a master in public health at Imperial College. So uh, I went through the large picture of looking at the on population effects into the details of the neurons. Now, uh, and this was extremely interesting in the way of looking at the critical points of the uh, osteopathy in general, uh, that actually uh, went through uh, several changes, important changes during the last 20, 25 years. In particular, in the last 10 years, there were a, a, bi a big um, research, research resources put on PubMed uh, that, ma that actually creates the um, uh, way in which we can look at the dogmas or the, the main pillars of osteopathy from a different lenses. So, yes. Excuse me, Francesco, be before you get started, we already have the first question uh, okay. re regarding one of your articles. Uh, are you able to, to see it on the screen? Yes. So Thank you, uh, Almut, you for, 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 for posting your question. Uh, I read your article about new model. Is there a documentation about your way to write it down, which can be used? Um, to write it down, uh, uh, I imagine, I, ma uh, um, I Im imagine that is something related to, um, uh, to how to use it. Uh, so um, the oh, the new model uh, has been just updated because today we uh, just had another another article published on frontiers in neuroscience. Um, that actually uh, increased the so that was the step the, the step forward the neo model and it's called the name so a neonatal manual assessment in in uh, in pediatrics and you can find it on uh, frontiers in uh, in in pediatrics and it creates a new way I mean an additional a further way of looking at the neo model uh, from a neurobiological perspective so. Um, we we have we are still producing uh, data on that front, so still documentation on that front. Uh, if you um, have any um, any specific question or anything you want to you want me to add, definitely you can write me uh, at the uh, at the email that you see on uh, that you see on the screen. Thank you. So. Um, uh, going back to you, uh, the, um, the, the the different pillars. So the and the neuroscience, how neuroscience might improve what uh, what has been published in the uh, or what it, uh, has been uh, documented in the in the last fifty years of research in in neuro in uh, in osteopathy. So that that was something interesting to me because actually we start from. Uh, all the different schools in education started from what is the biomechanical model so far, right? So that was in the, um, the idea of having an ideal posture that is the, uh, as, as it called the biome biomechanics axiom, that is the correct position of each structure in the body is ex uh, and uh, external forces applied with precision can return the body to proper alignment. So this is something that has been uh, taught for several so for several years, uh, but at the at the same time, it's something that uh, is um, related to an an ideal or an imaginary uh, element of biomechanics, because one of the main elements that actually or the main uh, drawbacks and pitfalls of biomechanics uh, seen in with these lens is that the, biome the biomechanical model is, assumes that there is only one correct position for any part of the human form or the human body. So meaning, therefore, that the ability that we have to compensate or the ability that we have to adapt into a different environment with a different internal or external condition seems to be irrelevant on, on the way of biomechanics was intended. Indeed, in the last 10, during the last 10 years, uh, a, a significant change in the way in which biomechanics has been seen uh, was challenged uh, initially with the uh, uh, Lederman article, 
um, published on CP, uh, CPDO, so the full of postural structural biomechanical model in manual uh, physical therapies, but also then uh, taken uh, from uh, Chaitov um, on a journal of uh, bodywork and mo movement therapies debate, where essentially what well, actually it opens. It opens a very interesting critical way of looking at biomechanics, not just only as a very linear uh, condition, but in a way that biomechanics is seen as part of a larger um, uh, contest, where the larger context, as pointed out by Lunghi, uh, uh, Tozzi, and Fusco, is uh, related by several elements that might be forces applied into the system, the anatomical uh, structure, uh, anatomical structural changes inside the tissue, the uh, influence, the influence that actually come from inside, like for example, aging, genetical or epigenetical elements, but at the same time, the responses that are the, the, uh, the body is having after a, spe a specific force is applied into the system, as well as all the environment, therefore the interaction that the body has uh, with, the, um, the, with the contextual uh, elements. And these creates, therefore, a way in which the biomechanics of the structure might adapt itself in order to make possible uh, the, between quotes, the alignment, where the alignment is not seen, therefore, as the element, the ideal element for the biomechanics, but at the same time is part of several uh, conditions, so as a cascade of biological events that actually ended up with the um, looking at the at the posture and looking at the anatomical structure and how they are positioned into the space in order to understand how the the body uh, reacts to spe specific forces. And these actually, as they continue in their interesting article published published a few years ago now, uh, the how these elements might be then um, matched with other. Uh, specific clinical um, contextual uh, elements, for example, uh, specific tests or uh, uh, specific uh, tests, uh, anatomical or some, uh, some uh, osteopathic test that creates and reveal the eventual variation, so eventual changes after, spe after a specific forces is supplied into the system. So in a way, we started from a very rigid model for in terms of biomechanics, and then little by little, we are shifting towards something their biomechanics is seen as a part of a larger context that is influenced by several elements. And one of these elements we'll see in later on is obviously the um, dynamic of the uh, central and autonomic nervous system. So we started from here, and, and therefore uh, there, there might be then uh, other elements that might be added to the, um, to the uh, discussion. Thank you for, for, the, for that first part. I, I, I read Ail's article and I know him, uh, I know him quite well. He, he comes to Vienna every year to teach our students in the masters. And he sure likes to provocate with his with his hypothesis, and he sure likes to uh, likes to destroy old old models, which I think is important. I, I, I and I, I really like the uh, debate that was uh, that was coming out of that. Uh, uh, and but I, I I thought his arguments were were much too simplistic. I thought he, in, in, uh, in his article, he was criticizing a model that didn't really exist in, in real life, where he talked about insoles in shoes and where he talked about se several aspects. In, in that, I, I don't know anyone who's using the model he's criticizing. So in a way, it's just, I think they call it the straw man fallacy. Uh, 
although he's got a point, of course. We, we, we do uh, use a lot of models and theories which just are not correct if you test them in research. But I, I, I was glad to, to see uh, the article by uh, Christian Lungi and Paolo Totti. I think if you put it in the right context, if you update it, then uh, you, it, you can say there is still a room for the biomechanical model. Or, or if, we, if we paraphrase Frank Zappa, you could say uh, the biomechanical model is not dead yet, it just smells funny or something like that. <laughs> that that's true, Raymond. I absolutely agree. So I think the uh, Letterman's article was uh, definitely something that he wants to challenge mm -hmm. uh, an old system so far. Uh, and actually, uh, it was successful in that sense because mm -hmm. actually it opened a way of looking in a very critical, a positive way to a, a, a system or a way of thinking biomechanics in a different way mm -hmm. so far. And also in way of looking at biomechanics or the biomechanical model applied into the uh, clinical context in, in a different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So creates the definitely creates the environment of uh, starting a, a deeper discussion into a specific model mm -hmm. and see actually how this discussion might induce several from teaching, from a teaching perspective, but also from a clinical and research perspective and standpoint, uh, what might be the, the effect of uh, look, critically looking mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at, the, at the elements. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's the, it's obviously it's not that actually because we are part of a biomechanical world so far, so we are moving mm -hmm. and therefore we are part of uh, using biomechanics as elements and as it demonstrated by several research also done by a, 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 good, a, a good group of research in REN, they actually they are using uh, a very advanced equipped uh, biomechan biomechanical tools in order to understand how the effect of the uh, the osteopathic treatment, specifically osteopathic treatment, mm -hmm. might have on uh, specific elements in uh, um, in in the structure, anatomical structure. So I think there is there definitely there is room, but at the same time the uh, uh, bones, muscles, uh, ligaments, and so on. Without the use or without the uh, the, the firing of the autonomic mm -hmm. and the uh, and the central nervous system might not have uh, a very long life so far, and th that's it's definitely clear also through different diseases or pathologies that are uh, that uh, can mm -hmm. can can be seen in uh, in the medical field. So th this actually is interesting because actually it gives us the possibility to uh, move forward from the, the biomechanical mm -hmm. contest and in, uh, insert the, uh, um, the autonomic uh, and central effect so, um, into, into all this system and how neuroscience might, might be the useful in this context. Because actually neuro neuroscience uh, the, uh, it develops in the uh, late 70s, 80s, uh, early 80s, and with um, a, a discipline that was looking at the effect of brain from a, um, a, cross, a, a cross disciplinary perspective. So the beauty of neuroscience is that there are different professionals that actually are coming together, mm -hmm. taking, the, uh, uh, taking the challenge of understanding how the brain uh, interacts with internal elements, so how to how the brain processes uh, elements, but at the same time how the brain is interacting with the environment. So uh, in this context, there are uh, the, the the way in which we can create and we can understand better how the also in the on the in the clinical context the study of brain, but not only the study the study of brain is um, important. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the clinicians, indeed, one of the main one of the main elements that actually we can take into account into into this context is uh, mainly related to uh, I'd like to uh, let's say summarize into uh, five main areas. So the areas are sensations. That means. 
uh, how the different senses are used. And in this case, we talk about obviously touch. It's one of the main elements that actually we use in our clinical practice, but also vision, hearing, and all the, uh, all the other senses. But perception, so the way in which those senses and those sensations are uh, embedded and develop something that is unique, that is personal. So we add the value to the, uh, to, uh, to the, uh, to the senses. And how it's important, this is important because actually in the clinical context, we have different perceptions. And one of the main elements is related when actually we treat um, a patient with four hands, so two operators, we might have, we use the same senses. So we can use touch, we can use the vision, we can use hearing and so on. Uh, but we might have different perception because actually the perception is the way in which people can interact with the environment and create based on its own background, a feeling. So, and this is why actually we can have different perception because the background, for example, might be different or the feeling that we have of the, the context might, might be different. The other element to take extremely uh, into account is the attention. So attention is... Excuse me, may I ask you a question uh, on, sure. on, on perception? What, what you just said uh, addresses one of the main problems we have in research that inter-rate reliability is very poor in most of the tests we do. Uh, what you currently said, does that mean there is no chance of getting that better because our perception is so different? Or should we continue with that line of research? What do you think? Th thanks for the question, Brian. That, that's interesting. And actually, it opens two big uh, elements. So the first one is statistical. And the second one is methodological. Mm -hmm. The first statistically is related to the fact that for ages also in the medical context, let's say in radiology or in any other mm -hmm. medical field, uh, specific uh, indicators were used to assess uh, integrated reliability, for example, the K, the K of uh, coins K, for mm -hmm. example, right? Now, has been uh, said that and has been demonstrated back in 2013, I think, with a beautiful paper published on BMJ, British Medical Journal, mm -hmm. that the coins K is absolutely a wrong measure to use in inter-rated reliability okay. from a statistical point of mm -hmm. view, because actually it doesn't match with the variability of the clinical practice. And we are not talking about osteopathy, so we are talking about all the way in which, so all the measures and tools that have been used in, in the medical field in order to uh, assess uh, inter-rated reliability. That's why DEVET, uh, that is, uh, she's part of a, one of the biggest and most successful group on cleaning metrics based in, uh, at the VU University in Amsterdam. Uh, they develop also other uh, measures that are more close to the, the clinical practice. That's called mm -hmm. agreement coefficients. So where the agreement coefficient uh, sli is slightly different from the uh, coins K and also gives more reliability to what is the uh, appropriateness in terms of clinical context uh, of a specific measure. So there is one, uh, so that is one point. So from a statistical point of view, and we need to take into account because otherwise we use the, uh, the, the wrong or the not appropriate statistical measure mm -hmm. in, order to in order to assess something that is uh, important in our case, in our specific case, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's also uh, not so reliable. So the majority of the, the study that has been published use the coins K, yep. but the, uh, the, the way in which they use apparently has internal statistical bias. So that's the first point. Mm -hmm. The second point is methodological. Now, I don't think that is, uh, it, it is important to have a reliable, a reliable measure. However, we don't have in nature, we don't have something that is reliable under percent. Mm -hmm. So, meaning that it's true that actually we have the idea, we have the vision of having a test or having palpatory findings mm -hmm. that can be absolutely reliable to, ev to everyone. But since we are dealing with sensation and perception, so senses and perception, there might be the interpretation of that specific 
uh, element that might be different. So it's a, a problem of measurements. So it's a problem. A met, there's, there is a meta, methodological problems in terms of the objective. So sometimes we have a problem in terms of selecting the the aim of what actually we need to agree upon, mm -hmm. rather than to say uh, something specific on the, for example, the somatic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My pleasure. I'll, I'll, I will look up the article. Interesting. I've never heard about so the, the agreement coefficient. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. that uh, 2013, I think, BMJ. Mm -hmm. So the, the other element that I would, la would like to uh, uh, introduce you uh, is the attention, uh, where attention is something that is um, uh, related to the way in which we focus uh, on something that we are uh, feeling, also the, the sense that we are using. So one interesting element here is that attention has a fluctuation mode. So uh, this has been studied by a few uh, groups, uh, in particular in Oxford, where actually they discovered that the way in which attention fluctuates is between 2 and 4 hertz. So it means that actually we don't have a, 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 a stable and flat attention, but the attention goes up and down. And when actually it goes up, we have the full attention, and then when we goes down, we have a less, uh, a less, a, a, a less impactful attention. So it means that our idea of paying attention to something is just related to a fluctuation mode. This is important. Why? When actually we uh, we um, uh, treat a patient, uh, deep and uh, if we think of what actually is our position our attentional position goes up and down. So we are not able to keep a, an atten the attention stable throughout the 20, 30, 40 minutes of, of treatment. It's absolutely impossible because actually it's extremely uh, cost. Um, and the, um, the energy that we put into the, the attention is extremely high. And it's impo impossible for the system to sustain and to keep that attention throughout that longer period. So we go up and down. And if we go up and down, we have the, the perception, because actually attention is directly related to perception. We have different perception that actually are based on the different attentional level that we have. So if someone comes and actually drive our attention to another uh, to another room because actually the uh, the bell rang or uh, because actually we hear the noise from outside, our perception actually changes. And it directly related to the to the fact that that tension is in this case was diverted some uh, some somewhere else, and this actually comes to one of the uh, articles that uh, we published, where actually we uh, put some um, uh, some, some subjects um, in the scan, the fMRI scan, and then there was a, a subject that was touching the uh, the feed. And while touching the feet, uh, the operator was either doing a, a tactile attention task, so focusing on what is the sensation of from, from the hand, or diverting the attention towards the beep coming from a headphone. So, and actually we demonstrated that if we have a attention towards the hand, then the patient Develop, starts to uh, respond. The the uh, the brain subject starts to the starts to respond directly with the inner part of the brain, in particular with the insula and the cingulate cortex. So it starts to change something inside the um, the body in terms of perception, and. This goes also to the, the other important element that is memory, where memory is the fact that actually we can record something, but we, all, we can also record sensations, in particular touch. So, and if we recall touch, it means that actually we can, uh, in the case, for example, the chronic, uh, chronic pain patient that actually comes several times, uh, we start recalling exactly the same perception or the same sensation because actually we have a memory of the uh, of the tissue that has been has been touched in the previous session. So in that case, the uh, uh, since the uh, the uh, the memory and the recall of the memory is extremely fast, we have an internal bias that might create the uh, the almost uh, the uh, the same perception and attention. 
And in and finally, the consciousness. This is a big chapter uh, in. Uh, Excuse uh, me. In... May, I, may I just uh, ask a question to clarify that? Sure. The, did I understand you correctly that, that you just said uh, when I see a patient re, uh, re repeatedly on the third or fourth session, I might m palpate some trapezius muscles and I might not feel what's actually going on now at the patient, but I might recall my memory of the last sessions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, that, that, and that's, that's scary. That's scary. Is, is there a way to avoid that? What, how can yeah, I? Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. Sure, we, we can be conscious and aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a way, that happens that the, uh, the, the, there are elements that actually we can take into mm -hmm. account. And also, there are uh, tricks or exercise, and the, uh, the, the, the type of the mindset that we have can be useful in order to understand mm -hmm. uh, what are, what, where are the, our internal bias. Mm -hmm. So, and these are also elements that can be um, trained, tested, and understood. So, uh, there, there are there are definitely there are elements on that front, mm -hmm. and the, these elements are also explored in. Uh, some of the uh, teachings that uh, um, can be done in in neuroscience so mm -hmm. far. Thank you. And this is and thank you to you. And this is actually linked exactly to what is consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's the way of uh, and how consci consciousness is a, a very broad uh, a, a very broad field. So um, it's not um, uh, due to time constraint. Actually, we can we can go into de uh, deeply into uh, the, uh, the the conscious the consciousness uh, level but the, it's interesting how in neuroscience the uh, the conscious the consciousness is what is going through something that is measurable in particular with uh, one of the theory uh, developed by Giulio Tononi an Italian guy that is working uh, at the Wisconsin University uh, since 20 years now is uh, um, um, and he developed what is called the IIT, so the um, uh, in, uh, information um, uh, uh, information theory, uh, integrated information theory, uh, where he developed a way of explaining consciousness uh, uh, using a, a very, um, let's say, complex mathematical and algorithmic model that creates an index that is called phi, and this phi has been linked to, interestingly, has been linked to uh, uh, specific disorders like uh, vegetative state and also minimal consciousness state. And, and they uh, they publish several papers on, on that front, also with Massimini. It's an, another Italian guy working at the University of Milan. And they actually tested the uh, the uh, clinical applicability of these uh, elements and why it's important in terms of uh, in terms of clinical practice because actually if we are conscious of something so if we can increase our consciousness we are more able to access uh, more precise processes more precise perception we have the ability to uh, interact with the uh, fluctuations of attention and therefore we can avoid what actually we were saying early on so the possibility of feeling a, uh, always the same type of perception that creates uh, a, a different outcomes as it happened for example Raymond when uh, one patient uh, come comes to me for example uh, it's a chronic pain patients are treated for three or four times. Then I, I then realize that I don't have the uh, the the results that I meant to be, mm -hmm. and then uh, goes to you, uh, and and immediately you you find a different way of approaching the patient, uh, and then the patient is, immediately feels better. So in that way, there are it's a by internal bias that might create in the first operator the fact that actually I'm not processing exactly the same. Uh, perception and sensation that are linked to attention, memory, mm -hmm. consciousness, in order to understand what the patient uh, has. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, this, is, this is something the, uh, that actually uh, leads to the uh, um, other elements that actually we tested, and the these the the paper that. Uh, 
uh, has been recently published on uh, a nature publishing journal, so scientific report. We tested how the uh, the five four sessions of osteopathy treatment might have a long term effect in brain specific brain areas, in particular the areas related to interoception, so the way in which we feel. And so what we showed uh, is that after three sessions we have a decrease of uh, activities. Uh, in terms of both the response, so uh, blood oxygen levels uh, respond, uh, of uh, interoceptive areas, including the right and the left insula, uh, the uh, cingulate cortex, the right cingulate cortex, and the right middle frontal gyrus, uh, as well as the, uh, the left lentiform uh, nucleus. So what does it mean? It means that since those patients were uh, patients with chronic low back pain, and it has been demonstrated that chronic low back pain patients has all these area firing higher compared to a normal state. What actually we demonstrated that using treatment, com using osteopathic treatment compared to uh, sham, so a fake treatment. Uh, the, we, uh, we were able to reduce the activities of those uh, specific um, areas in the brain. In addition to that, what actually we found is that when we uh, measure the accuracy of, uh, of heartbeat, that means patients were asked to count their own heartbeat by mentally diverting their attention towards the, uh, the heart and counting their, uh, the number of their, um, uh, the, the number of beats in a specific given time, 15 seconds. Now, then we match these numbers, so the, the perceptive number from the, from the subject to the real number, because actually they were also linked to a platysmograph that we had um, attached to the finger. So what actually we showed is that the difference between the perception and the real number of beats decreases uh, in after a month of treatment. It mean, in particular in the OMT group, so in the osteopathic treatment group, it means that actually the, those treated were more precise in decoding the, uh, the number of beats. What does it mean? It means that the brain decreasing their activities in those specific area becomes more efficient in decoding the perception and therefore a create, creating a better um, um, perception of itself. That in the, in, the clinic, in the clinical context, and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave you the floor, Raymond. In the clinical context, it, it means that uh, when actually a patient come back and feel, I feel better, he feels better not only because actually, for example, the, the anti-inflammatory effect of a treatment uh, took place, but also because from a central point of view, specific areas in the brain start firing in a more precise and appropriate way compared to the previous painful condition. Thank you. I, I, th I think this is really interesting <clears throat> that you are now using uh, the measurements in the insula and, and cingulate cortex and compare osteopathic techniques with sham techniques. A few years ago, when the whole research on C tactile fibers and interoception was published, one potential conclusion uh, could have been that you really don't need osteopathic treatment. You just have to apply soft touch to the hairy skin of your patient and you will get all these beneficial effects and relaxation and the patient will be happy. Uh, and it's, re it's really good to see that there still is a measurable difference between a very specific technique of a trained operator and the sham technique. Yes, uh, yes, Ramon, that, that's exactly the point. So um, what actually we are developing right now within the foundation is that um, uh, we strongly believe that the, um, the, the touch has two uh, essential components. There is one is non-specific or a specific type of touch, and the other one is specific type of touch. 
So where the aspect effect might be the effect of a, the C tactile, so the affective touch, uh, that creates the environment of the stimulation of the C uh, tactile afferent mm -hmm. fibers that goes directly to the insula. Mm -hmm. So and th this is something that is obviously related to care, to, to just mm -hmm. uh, gently stroking or just touching the patient in a very nice way. That it's important, but at the same time, might be different for a specific way of touching the patient using osteopathic approach or osteopathic techniques. So, and, and the, wh why are important these two elements? Because actually there, there might be some sharing component, so it's a gray area where the two uh, elements of touch are coming together, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, we have something that is unique that is specific for what actually we are doing. Mm -hmm. And this gray area then might be shared without absolutely no fear with other manual therapy uh, professionals, where the, the fact that actually uh, the majority of the manual therapy professionals has got results mm -hmm. in their clinics, it means something. Mm -hmm. So it means that actually we have a common components that might be uh, during these years, it, it seems to be the affective touch. So the CT fibers mm -hmm. might be one of the elements of this gray area. And then we might have different elements into the uh, uh, specific uh, components that mm -hmm. are, we are there might be not only regarded to the type of touch that we are using, but also the approach that we have. Mm -hmm. So the way in which we look at the patient, the, the, the contextual factor, and actually the, uh, these uh, opens um, another area of interest that has been uh, we, we are developing with Eden Foundation that is the the placebo effect mm -hmm. and the all the contextual factors uh, that actually are important in order to increase the effect of the, the clinical um, effectiveness mm -hmm. of what we are doing, uh, taking into consideration that the patient is in an, in an, uh, within an environment and reacts to this environment in a specific way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We got a question coming in to, uh, in, in, in regard of that topic from Regina. Hello, Regina. So, um, absolutely, uh, Regina. So uh, it's a matter of relationship between practitioner and patient. Absolutely agree. And this is, in, this is absolutely important to be recognized because actually we have a three components uh, when actually we're treating a patient. So there is the patient within its, its own, his or her own elements. So the uh, uh, background, uh, context of factual, in, immediate context of factual and future effects. Then there is the operator component that also has got its is or her own elements. There is background situation, uh, update situation, and future effects. And then there is the relationship between the two. So that is the third component. And it's important because actually from a neuroscience perspective, we can map all these three. And it actually it opens to you uh, possibly a new paper, uh, an upcoming paper that uh, it's uh, in submission that is on uh, a, a different way of looking at the models that includes these three, the, the three elements uh, in a way that actually neuroscience might be useful uh, to map uh, and to, um, um, let's say, measure these, these elements as a whole, as a, a new prediction. So uh, it's absolutely important, uh, and it's the essential element of uh, looking at specificity, where specificity is not just related to the type of techniques, but it's related to the way in which the operator uh, interact with the patient in a way that is patient, re, literally patient-based, patient-centered. Indeed, I think it's happened also to you, Raymond, when actually you, have, you are not grounded, you are not centered, so you are not fully focused on the patient in that, in that specific mm -hmm. uh, moment, the effects are completely different. Mm -hmm. Or actually when you are distracted or diverted your mm -hmm. attention towards something else, uh, for example, because someone you you um you had a, a very nice nice dinner last night, and then probably the the day after would be a great day. 
or if you had some uh, bad food, the, the day mm -hmm. after would be a diff very difficult mm -hmm. way. Why? Because actually are changing interoceptive elements, but not yep. only, it's changing also the environment. And therefore, it obviously becomes a different way of looking at the uh, at the in the relationship between mm -hmm. uh, patient and operators. In addition to that, uh, one of the elements of neuroscience is also synchronization. Uh, has been studied a lot of in terms of synchronization, how two people can be synchronized. Mm -hmm. And also there are some teachings on, on that spot that are uh, very interesting to, uh, to apply uh, in order to make it uh, real, uh, in order to improve, and how there are some tricks in order to uh, mm -hmm. synchronize uh, elements within uh, the, the patient and the operator. Do, do you have any, any reference on, on that topic? To, to get so started are, into this, the, the synchronization is interesting. Well, every osteopath probably knows and has observed that breathing is a synchronizing. Some have suggested that maybe even brain waves might synchronize. And there oh, are yeah. some studies that have shown electrical effects between the operator, between the osteopath and the patient. Do, do you have any good articles on, on that? So there are, there are, there are, there are, there are some mm -hmm. articles I'll send you out, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, two uh, big, uh, let's say, groups. One is from US and one, in, one is from Europe. They are mm -hmm. working on synchronization. And the, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, brain functions, but also in terms of, uh, let's say, physiological mm -hmm. uh, elements. One interesting uh, point that is a, 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 a very uh, simple example is the synchronization between mother and, uh, and son. Mm -hmm. So when actually there is it's a, a recent paper came out with, um, a, I think it was a Belgium group in collaboration with Francis McLone at the mm -hmm. uh, University of Liverpool, where actually they, they show that if the mother starts walking, and breathing at a certain rate and stroking on the back the sun, six months old, then after two minutes and a half, they start synchronizing the mm -hmm. heartbeat and the, uh, um, the uh, respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. So meaning that there is a definitely synchronization between people. And this actually has been also studied through a fMRI perspective mm -hmm. from the a US group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll send you out. Thank yeah. you. Really interesting. So but maybe it's time the, to move on with your slides. But, oh, yes. So, oh, okay. so, yeah, sorry. Well, the, no, the, no, the no. <laughs> so, so many interesting questions. We don't have a, we don't have a time limit here. We can, we can okay. go on all night. No one is kicking us out. So um, what, uh, what does it mean from a clinical standpoint? So in, in part, actually, we, uh, we, st we started already uh, um, describing uh, what uh, is important, but let's let's look at a specific um, uh, example. So, if we have uh, the uh, if we look at the uh, at pain, that is a very simple and uh, a quite um, let's say shareable uh, clinical condition. We have the uh, usually uh, the uh, the way in which the pain emerges is related to uh, protection. So we, uh, the, uh, the, the trash low, so when we start feeling pain, because actually we are close to what is called the true tissue capacity. So after that, everything will be broken. So it's in a way, a, a prote uh, it's a way of protection. That is in case of normal condition. However, when actually we have a, for example, a chronic pain condition, this buffer, starts to increase. So we start firing with pain much earlier compared to how was the previous situation. So the protection of the uh, made by the pain, so the, pre, the protection signal started to, starts to be a very earlier and be, uh, arrives much earlier compared to the previous condition. What does it mean? Because actually it means that our um, mechanism is starting to change. So in terms of uh, neuroscience condition, it means that actually there are specific areas like the insula, singular cortex, anterior and posterior singular cortex, and the uh, amygdala and so on, that actually are firing in order to say to the body, you need to stop, otherwise you are going to be broken. 
So on, on, um, despite the fact that actually we had a very big buffer, so we start what actually it ended up with a Lodinia, for example, or what is called sensitization. So and one important element into, into, into this topic is that pain, pain therefore provides a protective buffer so far. And the size of the pro protective buffer varies according to anything that is related to protection. So it's an important way to protect ourselves from the environment and from outside. However, what actually it means that actually in this, in the case that when the buffer starts to be starts to be extremely large, the system becomes way too protective. But it becomes way too protective in a way that actually also the patient that is seeing our hands coming closer probably he starts saying, oh, no, no, do not touch me because actually I have a lot of pain. So that is express the, the, uh, the way too protective of the patient. So the sensitization process and the sensitization process from a neuroscience point of view has been uh, largely studied with specific and clear um, anatomical and neurophysiological elements that actually changes. Now, how we can use these elements. So if we think at the previous paper and what actually it means in this context, it means substantially that we can, um, we can interact with specific areas that are pain related, that actually are otherwise called in neuroscience the pain matrix. So a matrix that is a group of brain areas that actually firing together in order to decode pain. And so we are just targeting those uh, those areas to uh, a specific outcome. So to reduce the buffer, so to uh, restore what is the usual and more um, appropriate way of the body and the brain to respond to specific and precise uh, stimuli. In this way, therefore, we can also have some effects that are not directly related to pain. So people start to be to feel, for example, more comfortable in um, or stressful situation, or they, they feel uh, more, um, uh, let's say, more confident. Uh, and, the, and this is actually a, a, a side effect, a good side effect, so a collateral outcome that actually we can achieve. And I think everyone uh, had uh, these experience uh, with patients in, or, in order to create a, a better uh, environment for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the patient itself. So this means, in general, that what is a, a very nice uh, synthesis from Moseley and, but uh, and Butler in 2015. Where actually we have in our inside our body we are what they call the uh, protectometer. It's a way in which we can decode the danger in me signs, the DIM, and the safety in me signs. So it means that while actually we treat, we shift the uh, um, the, uh, the the protectometers towards the seams. So the safety me, because actually we are more able to understand what are the appropriate signs and how we can when we need to uh, we need to re we need to respond to those specific uh, elements. So uh, from a clinical from a clinical perspective, look at the neuroscience. Therefore, it's important in order to understand how what we do when we interact with the patient might have a, a, a specific effect in the brain. But this actually is the filter to understand what is in a broader sense, uh, also uh, including the, uh, the the patient uh, into his or her environment during life. So that is the, uh, in synthesis, actually what uh, we um, what we we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way that actually we use, uh, let's say, lab test, lab research, 
uh, in order to understand more specifically what is happening in the brain, but having a clear idea of the, um, the transferability of this information into a clinical context in order to create a more uh, an, 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 an evidence-based informed practice that might benefit not only clinicians, but also the uh, patients in order to give them the answers or insights that actually are coming from uh, the, um, uh, the research contest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it, it, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, end of the presentation to, to, to end with Explain Pain by Mosley and Butler, which really, uh, which really uh, help a lot to, for, for us to give patients a new model to what they're experiencing. It is true. Yes, it is true, uh, Raymond. Uh, it's exactly the way in which the, let's say, the, the, the pain study and the pain research is moving right now. So in a more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's a, a much broader view of the patient that is not just related to uh, uh, nociception, but it's related to pain. So it's really also including the perception and not only the, uh, um, the mechanical uh, biophysiological stimuli uh, coming from uh, pro-inflammatory substances yep. so far. I'm, I'm not really sure if it's a broader way of looking at, 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 at pain. You know, I've, I've, I felt that 15 or 20 years ago, the psychology and the relationship between practitioner and patient didn't play any role and it, and it was just a missing element. And then uh, the whole biopsychosocial model became really strong and now I feel the pendulum has almost swung too far into the other direction and now biopsychosocial is everything. And this is sometimes disregarding the fact that there is something like uh, physical uh, restrictions that we can treat to make feel people better. What, what do you think about that? It is true, um, Raymond. I think that the, the uh, BPS model, so the biopsychosocial uh, model, it's, uh, was a, a, a very nice way of uh, moving further mm -hmm. uh, into the, uh, the consideration of the, um, of the patient. However, uh, they, they might miss something, that is neuroscience. So that's why actually we are developing a different model that is also is based on uh, predict, uh, predictive processing. That is a way of looking at the uh, biopsychosocial model, but with the way that the brain is part of this entire system. Mm -hmm. So and how the brain might predict what's going to happen in terms of new perception, but based on the, some, some elements on the background, some elements on the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the life of the, of the patient, mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, one great opportunity in this sense is the fact that actually we are part of this process, uh, where uh, early on, where the pain was considered just a, between quotes, a mechanicistic approach, Yep. Uh, there was just only the, uh, the pharma pharma pharmacological research mm -hmm. on that front, right? So in this way, instead, in now it's definitely clearer, and also with paper published on the Lancet, uh, New England Journal mm -hmm. of Medicine, BMJ, yep. so all Nature, so all the top journals, that the pain is better managed in a way of biopsychosocial mm -hmm. way. So in a way also, the patient is embedded within the process of uh, getting better. Mm -hmm. So in the way in which the, uh, the, um, the patient is relevant for uh, its own way of uh, improving uh, himself or herself. The, 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 the Lancet edition on low back pain was great a few years ago, wasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely, Raymond. Absolutely, Re really surprising to read uh, and to read articles like that in in Lancet. Ab absolutely, absolutely agree. And it act uh, these actually shift uh, significantly the way in which actually we can look at diseases. 
and also we look at uh, problems uh, and disturbances from a, a, let's say, a more appropriate perspective, rather than uh, just linear effect, but also taking into account what is around the patient. And in this context, definitely the, uh, uh, the osteopathic clinical practice might play a role. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I saw you got another slide coming up on the OPERA project, especially yes. for our listeners in Austria here. Yes, so that, that is a, a recent project that we launched in, uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Austria. And this is part of a, a larger uh, European, but not only European survey, uh, osteopathic survey. And this is called the uh, Osteopathic pra Practitioner Estimates and Rates. So it's an online cross-sectional uh, project looking at the specific elements in the profile of uh, osteopathic professionals uh, in, in specific countries. So uh, the, this is the, the link where all the, um, the osteopaths uh, can, uh, can access and can also uh, participate to the, um, to, the, uh, to the questionnaire. And the opera now has been carried out in several uh, European or Euro European countries. Uh, including uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Italy, Spain, Portugal, now it's Austria, Switzerland, France. Uh, we are starting uh, another one in Brazil and in Canada. So the idea is to have the uh, um, a, a better and more appropriate description of the profile of osteopaths in the country. Uh, in order to understand better what, what are the, the main elements that uh, uh, are distinguishable in uh, the different countries and how then we can match and benchmark in different countries together. So uh, you can see also the, the, the website is there, the opera-project.org, and underneath the project Austria, there is the, uh, the possibility to access to, the, um, to, the, uh, to participate. Uh, to the uh, survey as well. Thank you very much. I would I would like to second your your call uh, to uh, to participate. Uh, it is really it, it's really important when whenever we present the profession in uh, either, either to the general public or to authorities. I remember that a couple of years ago when the Osteopathic International Alliance they did their status report on. Uh, how osteopathy is practiced in uh, around the world <clears throat> and they asked how many osteopaths are there in Austria we had to guess uh, and to be uh, to have clearer answers to that would also help us in our discussions with the Ministry of Health regarding recognition of osteopathy uh, we need more facts and uh, this is one way to get there so thanks a lot for uh, doing this in collaboration with the Austrian Osteopathic Association yes mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I saw we have one more question uh, for, for, on the topic of on the topic before uh, from Regina again. So uh, it means that we support patients uh, in their self-regulation. Absolutely, Regina. Absolutely, in self-regulation and self-awareness. So this is something that has been always regarded to uh, osteopathy, right? So we promote uh, self-healing. We promote self-awareness, self-regulation. Yes, and the, we have the basis to demonstrate that. We are still at the beginning, so it was an axiom of osteopathy so far, mm -hmm. but now we have definitely the possibility to uh, demonstrate that uh, with data, and these uh, will definitely open a new way of looking uh, at, the, at the patient through the osteopathic lenses. And this is a, in a way that is uh, more evidence-based, but that is not uh, depre deprecating the uh, uh, history and traditions, but is just adding to history and tradition the, uh, um, the data uh, that has been always, um, um, always meant to be there so far. So the intuition that they had, uh, there was a right intuition that they now can be demonstrated. And it can be demonstrated through uh, rigorous research, but in particular through the collaboration between everyone. So clinicians that might have ideas, 
uh, clinical researcher that might have attitudes both in a clinical and research context, and also researcher that might uh, share their experience and their met methodological um, elements uh, in order to uh, justify a specific uh, idea and a clinical question, a research question. Yes. Thank you very much, Francesco. This was a lovely closing statement, and I like the part where you said that it's uh, up to us to uh, question the her heritage that we have in osteopathy, but also to validate the part of it that's correct, and uh, and really to also to cherish the intuition that uh, the, our, our lecturers and their lecturers and the forefathers had. That's and true. And I'd like to thank you for again for the valuable uh, work you do for the profession. I, I really think it's it's a, a, a very exciting period to be an osteopath, a very exciting period to teach osteopathy, because there's so much more information that we can access now, and that we can integrate with the traditions that that we learned and that we were taught in. I fully, fully agree, um, uh, Raymond, and that, that is a very exciting on that front. Uh, so I feel uh, your word resonates with me. Uh, and uh, definitely, uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank you for uh, the opportunity that you gave me uh, to share some of uh, our uh, research, some of our uh, insight, uh, and hopefully uh, there, there will be uh, a further updates also with other people that might look at the, at the video and they can uh, easily uh, contact me or contact you and uh, in order to make all these environment that we just started uh, mm -hmm. more uh, florid, more profitable uh, with uh, uh, further insights. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for an exciting hour, hour and something. Uh, uh, as we discussed yesterday, Maybe we will we will uh, do a follow up uh, in in a, in a few weeks with a different uh, topic with a different emphasis, maybe on the profession as a whole and not so much on uh, the approach to the individual patient. Really exciting work. Pleasure. Really, really pleasure. R really a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for all uh, everyone who was watching the um, uh, the uh, interview. Thank you very much, Raymond. I would like to thank everyone in the audience, everyone for watching. We currently don't have any detailed plans on when the next installment of uh, Café Steel Point will go live, but we will keep you updated. And one way to, uh, to, to get the updates is to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. The other way is to send us your email address. You'll be on our list and you won't miss a thing. Have a nice rest of the evening and Thanks for watching.